What's going on, guys? I am Nande Mogai. We're joined, of course, with the Hackers Curator team, Jen Teen Prez, Chris Pissy Kitten, and of course, the director himself, Ian Softly. Ian, thank you for your time. Uh, we're excited to have you here, and we're going to start off with our classic first question. How long has it been since you've seen Hackers? Uh, I saw Hackers, um, I think the last time was uh, the 20th anniversary. Uh, and I saw that, I saw a few screenings. I saw one in New York, which was great. We got a lot of the cast together. Uh, and we had, um, we had one in London as well, which was uh, really exciting in an amazing cinema, Prince Charles cinema. Um, and we, and both cases, it was projected on 35 millimeter film. So that was uh, pretty exciting. And then Mark Commode, who's been a real quite a prominent journalist in the, in the UK. He also curates um, a festival in, in Cornwall, which is kind of like the West Country surfing area in the UK. And, um, and we had another great 35 mil screening then. That was about five years ago. Well, our second question is usually, how did you get involved? But um... As you know from our interview with Jeff Kleeman, we heard that John Callie and Jeff approached you shortly after Backbeat and offered you a pretty unique pay or play deal to direct hackers. Um, how do you remember that conversation going and what was kind of going through your mind at the time? <clears throat> well, I just done um, Backbeat and Backbeat was really, it had, I hadn't been released, I don't think. So everything happened very, very quickly. Backbeat took me about 10 years to get, get going and it was my first movie and wow. I was you know, I had the idea 10 years before I made the movie, which which isn't that unusual in terms mm -hmm. of a gestation period. But I probably spent two or three years intensely trying to get back me together, which felt you know like a long time. But then once we'd made the film, which we made the film in um, in the spring of 1993, we then previewed it a couple of times in the United States. And it was clear that it had a potential, you know, to have a cinema release. The, the kind of the big significant thing there was that we were selected to be one of the opening night films the Sundance Film Festival. Mm -hmm. It was kind of confusing for me because all, all the big agencies um, had somehow seen the film, you know, and, and I think it was even before Sundance. My agent said to me at the time, he says, there's three people that are in demand in Hollywood at any one moment. Steven Spielberg, who, who's just won, the, whoever's just won the Oscar, <laughs> and the new kid on the block. Right. Said, this isn't going to last long. <laughs> this isn't going to last long. <laughs> and so there was that moment of a few, just a few weeks. And my agent in London um, was um, Jenny Casarotto, and her colleague was a guy called Greg Hunt, who said that he'd heard that this script had come to my agent, Robert Newman, in LA. And he said it's a real coincidence because it's written by this guy that I used to. This is this is my London agent Greg uh, talking. Um, uh, he said I used to go to the gym with this guy, Raphael Moreau, and when he was in New York, when when my agent was in New York, and he said so. I just and he was talking to me about this project Hackers. So the fact that it was sent by United Artists, John Kelly and Jeff Kleeman, to LA. It seemed that there was some kind of, you know, it was some kind of fate. I mean, there were a number of things being offered to me, but the thing that was different about Hackers was, first of all, when I read it, I thought it, what I loved was its freshness and its kind of originality. Everything else that came to me seemed to have been kind of written to some kind of formula. You know, it was, a, it was what you'd expect American studios, um, very commercial, very, very, very mainstream. Yeah. And it seemed... I immediately saw the link with um, with Backbeat in that it was about a group of people trying to create a sort of a counterculture um, at a time when it was in its infancy, as 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 with the, as with my first film Backbeat about the Beatles in, in Hamburg. It was kind of like a, a Beatles origin origin story in, in many ways. And so this was like a sort of a you know, like an online community cyber culture origin story in a in a way. Yeah. Um, and, and I just, I, it, it also was clear to me that I could creatively, there was a lot of flexibility and freedom because it needed a world to be created. Jeff and John were just incredibly aggressive um, about wanting me, me to do hackers. It just all seemed to, it all seemed to sort of come, come together. And yeah, they were, they, I think they wanted to, to 
make sure that I went with them as opposed to some of the other projects that was being offered. And I think they wanted to make a statement and make sure, because also they, you know, they, they didn't want it to drag on. So they wanted to make like a preemptive strike, if you like, in terms yeah, of- Yeah, certainly. Um, which was amazing for me, but um, I, th I think I can honestly say it was kind of secondary to the fact, the fact that, because I'm sure that, you know, there might've been something else, you know, a similar offer, but, but um, I, I think it was because I just saw this as an opportunity. I, I saw how I could make, and it, it felt very like a more familiar world to me than a lot of the other films that were very much kind of rooted in American culture. Totally. And it is interesting to hear that, that new tie in now about uh, Raphael and your agent. Uh, you, you've mentioned it's like fate and especially with our interview with Jeff Kleeman and, just seeing how all these weird random things came together that essentially made this movie happen is kind of fascinating. <laughs> but let's talk about the script. Yeah. So Ian, once you uh, had the script in your hands in front of you, did you feel like there were parts of that script that you were wanting to further develop or revise? Or were there any chunks in there that you're like, this really needs to be reworked or? Well, first of all, I, well, I, 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 I thought it was very humorous and it's something that I forget until I, you know, one of the things that really surprised me, two things that really surprised me when I saw it again five years ago was it's really funny. Uh, and that, and I responded yeah. to that. And, and it doesn't take itself seriously. It's not supposed to be this kind of like, you know, really kind of like intense, accurate survey of what the technological environment was at the time. Yeah. It's, it's kind of kids having fun. It's kind of like anarchic. And, and their dialogue, I think, is brilliant. And the characters, the way they're defined is so, was so brilliant. I wanted, I wanted to visualize that and, and, and for them to have an impact on the world that they lived in. So, I mean, just taking one thing in, in, in particular, um, Cyberdelia, that Cyberdelia, I think, was just a coffee bar. Obviously, the costumes, of, you know, working with, with Roger Burton, they were almost like expressions of their personality almost like they were their own avatars. Yeah. Um, the inside of the computer. I mean, none of this was in the script, you know, so the inside of the computer, that idea of the visual, the, the 3D data, the, the, the city of text, um, that sort of visualization wasn't, wasn't there either. So the whole kind of creation of that, you know, cyberdelic world was something that I saw there was an opportunity to do. And I think that was the biggest change. The other thing was that I, I think I made it a bit sexier. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. And that was partly because the casting is so they're sort of on the cusp because I think when you're a 15, 16, 17 year old, your, your heroes are kind of slightly older than you. And you see yourself as wanting, wanting yeah. to be taken as a little bit older. And because of that, there was, you know, I, I sort of wanted to, um, to steer as close to the line as I could in terms of, sexuality and and you know there's there's some there's some nudity in the film there's sexual references um uh and i don't think they were there before um because mm -hmm. uh, i can remember that was a pass that i that i that i put on it and i, I know that some of the people that were working with me they really responded to that and said oh, oh that's kind of like can, you know that will take it out of being a high school movie yeah and a sort of an early 20 something movie which was sort of what the target was really it was sort of teens to to early 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 to mid 20s that's right were you still working with Raphael at that point like were these things you were workshopping with him yeah I mean this was a new thing for me really I mean it was kind of exciting in that sense and so that I was seeing in, in the way that the character Dade was seeing New York as an outsider I was seeing New York as an outsider I, mean, I had been I had been to New York before but I really spent started to spend quite a lot of time in New York yeah uh, and part of that, you know, I'd be casting, I'd be looking at locations, I'd be talking to collaborators, um, you know, sometimes meeting research meetings, sometimes with, with you know, the hacker groups. But, but yeah, Raf, Raf was, was there um, and his wife, Kristen, at the time, she mm -hmm. was quite involved as well as a kind of script editor. And, and then they came to London, I think they came to London once or twice. Uh, yeah, so I, so they would be, you know, in a hotel room, or if it was in New York, in their in their in their um, apartment, writing, and I'd be feeding. We would kind of evolve. I was I'd be giving them notes all the time. Well, I want to go back to what you were saying about the technology for a second. So back in 1994, the internet wasn't exactly mainstream. A lot of people didn't even have a personal computer in their homes. 
what was your personal experience with computers and the internet prior to hackers? Very, very um, thin on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> very minimal. It, you know, it, re it really was. I mean, I was aware of it as a sort of a, as, as a kind of a developing thing. In fact, when I was working for uh, Granada Television, which, which was an independent television company in the UK that had a reputation of being sort of quite risk-taking, I did work on a program called The Invaders. Um, when I was working with a, um, another uh, researcher who was who was much more au fait with computers, and we did find people like you know like Joey, we found this kid called Eugene in um, Liverpool who had created all these games from his sort of back room. So I was sort of aware of that. Um, and I was obviously upgrading my, my computer, my Macs for, for, for writing, you know, purposes. Um, I mean, and that, that, that came in sort of right, even when I was doing the first draft of Backbeat, you know, probably in late eighties, early nineties, I was using sort of you know computers as, as as word processors, and I was aware of people who were you know that people were talking about the net and you know in Dungeons and Dragons games at universities. I was sort of aware of that, but in terms of my, actually me being online, I mean that was sort of not that much before I was doing hackers, and and I and I, and I got my you know I went online with my own name. Um, Ian at crash.demon.co.uk. Um, yes, <laughs> nice. yes. <laughs> that was, uh, and that was um, just as we got to New York. There was a there was um, uh, a server called um, New York Online. Do you, do you yeah, know? we've heard about yeah. this. Mm -hmm. And there was a very cool guy, a Rasta guy, you know, dreadlock guy who was, <laughs> sort of, he, he was on set with us. He was like one of our consultants. So we picked up all these really cool people along uh, uh, along the way, and a lot of our graphics that I would approve would be sent overnight by Neil, Neville Brody, and then we would download them and put them onto the computers on set. So that there was a kind of it was really it was at the beginning of that learning curve for me. So we've heard that some of the consultants you worked with were from twenty six hundred the New York chapter, how, yeah. how key were they to your research efforts? Um, well, I think they were very key in the beginning with, with, with RAF. Uh, when we were in, in that kind of extended pre-production process in New York, it was very, very exciting. I attended some of the meetings with, with, with RAF. And then as part of the casting process, I brought Johnny e. Lee Miller over from London to read with some of the potential Kate Libby's. We went to some of those um, hacker conventions and 2600 meetings. And then uh, when we were shooting, we had a group of people, a uh, kind of loose group that kind of seemed to expand and contract that, you know, people, <laughs> hey, I've, I've brought my friend along, you know. <laughs> so there were some people that I think have, have like talked about them being, you know, working on the movie that weren't actually kind of hired by us, but they were just sort of around. Um, Lurking uh, in the shadows. And there was... Um, there was one guy in particular, I can remember one thing he said to me, he said, Ian, will you tell me when the next hair dyeing party is on? You know, because <laughs> the actors, I actually dyed my hair um, for the first day of shoot as a kind of uh, in sympathy with the, with the actors or kind of- Solidarity, you know, hair solidarity. solidarity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just to give them a bit of fun and surprise them a little, wow. <laughs> he would sometimes rewrite the script or suggest, not actually rewrite it, but suggest, you know, technical updates and things. And I can remember one particular instance right on top of the Empire State Building. He said to me, he said, oh God, look, you know, I know this is really, I'm not gonna try the American accent. He said, I know this is really bad timing, but I think that, you know, that, that we, we can change that dialogue to make it a little bit better. So I said, oh, okay, you know, because there's nothing that an actor <laughs> understandably likes less than getting um, if, you know, a rewrite just as you're about to shoot. <laughs> yeah. So I said, well, look, just write it out and I'll, I'll, I'll talk, it was, it, was, it, was, it was Angie's. And I handed it to her and I said, look, you don't have to do this because I know it's really unfair, but actually this is more accurate. Um, and she went, okay. And that was right on top of the Empire State Building. Yeah. And I think we managed to get a lot higher wow. than I thought we were going to be able to. I think we just kept going up 
expecting that they're going to, and we kind of, we got to that, and then we opened a door, and it took us outside onto this kind of these gantries, which were right underneath the communication dishes, which you can see in the film, and it's way <laughs> higher than we planned to go. It's one of the things <laughs> you do when you make movies, is you get to places that you can just not normally get to. And, you just uh, pull that card, be like, I'm pretty sure we want to do it from over there. Yep, there. How do we make that happen? What if? <laughs> and you're like, little Eugene? Little yeah. hacking Eugene, what do you think? Yeah. Can you yeah. get us onto that? <laughs> yeah. and, and and then also, I mean, that was a special thing because the weather yeah. was amazing and it was so high. And you know, it's high anyway. And we just went like it was like another 150 feet above where the public can get to. And I had no idea that we could get that high. And it was actually visually very important because it because the fact that there were the, the <laughs> dishes meant that we could get scale. So we could kind of like, we could, we, you could see the actors in relation to those dishes, you know, which were kind of quite big. And, and you got a sense of, I mean, that scene where, <laughs> yeah. where, where Serial kind of leans back over, but oh my God. I <laughs> know. To this day, every time I see that scene, I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> like a part of me sinks. Yeah. Was everybody <laughs> on board for doing that? Like, did you get the whole cast? Everyone was like, yes, get us all the way up here. No problems. And well, I, I maybe somebody said, "Oh wow, you know, this is you sure, you know, I'm sure that I, I have, I've, I've edited that out of my memory." Yeah, yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. I'm the sure. post-traumatic stress you might have caused people <laughs> <laughs> who will never leave the ground anymore. Did you personally learn about anything that could be achieved through hacking that really sort of blew you away at the time? Uh, well, yeah, I mean everything. I mean <laughs> the, the extent, the extent to which everything could be controlled. You know, whether it was uh traffic lights um you know control systems or you know uh, bankrupting somebody you know <laughs> or, but that's the whole thing it's just and that was one of the things i thought was exciting about the script it's like because i thought a lot of people wouldn't realize this yeah. and of course people said oh that's preposterous you know and so that's the risk that you run <laughs> um i remember that one of the reviews that was less than favorable from the orange county register who who um I kind of written that one off because they, they never give my films a good review. Um, and they said, everybody knows this is ridiculous because the internet is only ever going to be white or black text on a white or black screen. Um, and they were saying all this kind of, all this kind of imagery and these pictures and is, yeah. is You just send them <laughs> copies of that article every year as we go on just repeatedly, <laughs> which is like a smug face yeah, exactly. picture of you on it. <laughs> Interesting about that whole thing of, um, you know, what I thought could be done and what I thought couldn't be done. I mean, of course it goes on, it continues. Um, and it's sort of, it's like that was the sort of the, the nursery slopes of what is happening now, but it was, yeah. that was the beginning of the direction of travel, you know, that, that you could sort of, that you could get into anything that was controlled uh, online and, and manipulated. Um, I remember I was two years ago uh, in fact, that's when I last saw Hackers, was, was at this, a festival called the, the Electromagnetic Field. I don't know whether you, you know those guys. Uh, and they're part of a sort of a hacking group. Um, they have a festival, they alternate between, I think, Holland, which is a, and Germany, which is huge, and then yeah. just nothing in the UK. And there was a mixture. They actually had a Cyberdelia club there. And it's a nice. kind of a, it's, yeah. it's a techno and a tech festival. And, <laughs> Uh, and I was interviewed by Jake Davis, who's one of the anonymous guys, yeah. you know, who said that you know hackers was was a kind of a big influence on him getting into it in the first place. Um, but they had talks from people that would some of them dressed like you know Angelina in in, in hackers, <laughs> tattooed and pierced and uh, looking like you know looking like Angelina, looking like acid burn, and and they were now what, senior people in tech and government or or big firms and saying that when people somebody comes into your house you should have a uh, a sign under the doorbell saying you are he by hereby give permission for every conversation that takes place in this house to be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> because your, your smart tv can you know, can record it you know yeah. so ian jumping back into a little bit of pre-production right so you've yeah. got the job you've got the script you're putting your team together and and you're starting to really develop how this film is going to work and how it's going to come about yeah. Between yourself and John Beard and the rest of the creative team, can you just give us a like a brief taste of what those brainstorming sessions were kind of like in the very early well, onset? It was, it was very exciting because 
with every step we went on that journey, you know, with every time we scratched the surface and tried to get, you know, below, everything, everything kind of like came back at us or, uh, you know, the, the ideas and the worlds and the people that were presenting us, we, we were aware that there was loads of people who were excited about this as, as being something. I sort of half thought that it would be seen as a geek kind of side issue, but it was clear that everybody thought this is what the mainstream was going to be. Uh, and that emboldened me really yeah. to, you know, to, 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 to sort of push it as far as, 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 as I could in, you know, with, with, whether it was with Roger with the costumes or whether it was, you know, Cyberdelia or whether it was getting inside the computer and, you know, that, like a three dimensional database that somehow, you know, a hallucination of what the, what the guys who are operating or who are entering that world are, are thinking. That's it's sort of like a, a physical, expression of what's inside inside their head so it, it just seemed every, and, and then you know we, we we met people at mit john had ideas about people that we could meet and talk to razor and blade headquarters was actually in the office of, a, of an industrial designer called ron arad who's kind of very very well on the, there's a ron arad yeah. museum in 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 paris you know i mean right. So that we were using a lot of these people who were out there and using it. And there was also um, uh, a guy called William Latham, who, who was doing computer um, art. And, and the worm kind of was influenced by William Latham's kind of computer um, organism uh, yeah. paintings. Uh, so there was all sorts of, and, and then of course, part of John's team was, was a, a woman called Joanne Woolard, who, who'd, uh, I think she's won Academy Awards and she went and worked on Gravity, subsequently, sadly, no, no longer with us. But, mm -hmm. but she came to all the clubs with us, you know, so we talked about putting the, the laptop uh, guitar straps. And so this, this parallel, oh, yeah. was like a band, but it was sort of like their rock and roll. And, and we would go to the clubs in New York and talk to people there and talk to people who were, you know, and Neville Brody as well. He was really interested because he was, that was the direction that, you know, things were already going. Yeah. But I think in, in terms of graphics, that kind of the, the influence of computers was, w w was there already in the sort of the eighties. I know when I was at um, NADA television, it was, you know, they used that as part of the factory records. There's that famous Peter Saville, um, like a sort of a, a, a waveform um, that looks like a mountain range mm -hmm. uh, and that came out of techno music as well so you know the fact that it, it that I think one of the things that has made the film endure and the soundtrack endure is that it was you know it was just around the corner all that um, okay so to pivot a little bit um, to something that a lot of people in the fandom talk about uh, so I don't think rollerblading has ever been cooler <laughs> than or represented in a cooler way than it has in the movie Hackers. Um, yeah. So what sort of prompted that as the mode of transportation decision it, in the well, movie Well, it Hackers? was what was happening at the time. You know, that, that's, that, that was very contemporary. That wasn't like looking into the future. That was just what was happening. Um, I mean, Central Park, uh, in 94 certainly hundreds maybe thousands of people rollerblading right wow um, and the streets of new york you know people would people would rollerblade and it was to a, to a lesser degree in london but it was still that it, it was it, that was you know roller skating had come back big in the in the early 80s and then and then it became rollerblades and um uh, and you know, at the time we were making the film, is one of the things that struck me about New York is is that it was a huge, huge thing in in New York at the time. It was just that that that's what it was, and there was something else. Um, and it was one of the things that didn't make it into the film. It's only in that there's one scene in the film. I created this group of um, I called them cyberbladers, um, yeah. and it's just was one night. It was two or three in the morning, and the streets were kind of empty, and there were these, uh, there was this group silently just. Just I saw I kept seeing them, you know, through the through the um the cross street. They would appear and then we would go, you know, down the avenue and then they would appear in the next cross street. There's about four or five of them, and they were all in silver and they had silver face paint and they and and I think they had neon torches. And so I thought, I've got to have that in the movie. So I created <laughs> them and you actually see them in um you see them just in the in, in when subway, in subway, right? But yeah. that, that, that I, shot them, I shot them in a few more circumstances in the movie, and uh, I can't quite. I kind of think maybe I should have 
made more of an effort to put them in because I think it's, <laughs> it's really it's a really it's a really cool thing. Um, and and uh, I mean, I I, uh, I made a comment um, at one point saying, well, you know, it's kind of dated. The rollerblades is dated. And then I got these like emails and, and posts from furious kind of you know rollerbladers <laughs> saying it's not that dated. You know, we do it all the time still. Um, but but it, uh, we we had we had uh, rollerblading. Um, classes uh you know i think it was computing in the afternoon and roller, or the other way around <laughs> and, uh, and i remember they had they had stopping clinics in high park in in, in central park <laughs> and everybody was getting on rollerblades and nobody could stop because you know they get up great speeds so every periodically i think it was the you know the local authorities had 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 these you know you could be you could be taught how to stop effectively <laughs> Well, I will say I, I, until the pandemic started, I was working in Midtown Manhattan and I will say there has definitely been a resurgence of rollerblading in the last couple of years. There you go. But Ian, you've already given us some really fantastic um, anecdotes, but I have one for you. <laughs> Are you aware that, that in Danny Boyle's biography, Danny Boyle authorized edition, he said that when he was filming Train Spotting, which was shortly after Hackers, yeah. um, he had to ask Johnny and Angelina to stop rollerblading upstairs because they were disrupting the filming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they, 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 they obviously got the bug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> John Beard introduced you to Roger Burton for costumes. And then yeah. an excellent decision that obviously we're all so glad that happened. <laughs> um, so how easy was it to make that decision to bring him on and how much did he ultimately kind of blow your mind with the ideas that he brought to the table? Oh, it was pretty easy. I mean, uh, he, you know, the, he came in with a sort of like an idea board, pictures and stuff. And I just went for it straight away. You know, like the guys and some of the kids in school in kilts. And I think there's some with, with guys with barcodes, you know, barcode tattoos and, um, and using sort of kind of surf culture mixed in, you know, with the idea being of surfing the internet and uh, light reflective material and costumes mm -hmm. and stuff. You know, um, mm -hmm. I, I was I was very, you know, I was given such a carte blanche by by Jeff and John. They just said, "Do your thing," you know, "Do what you did with Backbeat." At times, they might have gone, "Whoa." <laughs> 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 well, I didn't think he was going to go that far, um, uh, but they were supportive, and they was, you know, I think John was of, of the view that he, because he'd lived through this in the in the seventies, and I think he might have told me the story that that all of a sudden you had studio execs only commissioning things that they couldn't understand right. because they knew that that was probably. The stuff that everybody else was going to want to see you know as soon as i was introduced to roger it was quite, it, he, it was clear he was just on the same on the, on the same wavelength mm -hmm. um and similarly with um chrissy um, um blandel and 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 liz Draxauer, hair and makeup same mm -hmm. thing they just everybody was really excited because they knew that what i wanted them to do was just to kind of hit me with really out there stuff and and they sort of knew the color palette they knew the you know the, the visual references the walls of the you know the production offices were just covered and they were like you know it was it was quite clear um the the, the direction that, that we wanted to take it in so Ian, let's let's jump into casting um yeah. you know we, we've learned quite a bit uh over our various interviews with with cast and crew up to this point um but i i suspect you have a very different perspective on what that casting process was like um, and some of the ins and outs of, of who was selected and why. So give us a little bit of your perspective on the casting process. Well, uh, it's, it's a well-known phrase, you know, that, that the script and the, and, the, and the cast are absolutely essential first elements, if not the most substantial elements in, in making a film. And, and so I, I really take that responsibility for both I think they're both my responsibility. And, you know, that's part of what you're hired to do as a movie director is to supervise and to sign off and, right. and not to stop until you're satisfied. So the search for casting is a really, really um, intense process. And, and, and you have two parameters. You have one parameter is I want the best person for that role. The person that I saw or the closest to what I saw when I was reading it, you know, the way that my, you know, the idea that I have the type of 
character, the type of actor that I want. Sometimes an actor will come in and, and do an audition and go, oh, wow, that's a different direction. I, I hadn't imagined that, but that's amazing. Yeah. Um, but usually it's like, you've just got to get the right person. And you look and you look and you look and you look. And, and so you cast the net very, very wide. And the other thing is, which to be, which the, the thing I didn't realize how lucky I was, but the other consideration is, you know, are they somebody who is, has a profile who will work for financiers, you know, who, mm -hmm. who's, a, who's a movie star enough. So to do that process, then, you know, the casting directors are, are really important. And I had in London, uh, Michelle Gish, um, who again died recently, sadly, but she, you know, she's a very, very experienced casting director. She works with Mike Newell. She worked with John, John Madden and many, many other people. And, you know, they know everybody who's out there. I saw kind of every young actor, male and female in, in London when I was there with, with, with Michelle. Mm -hmm. And Johnny came out of that process. At the time, Johnny was sharing a house. I was, it was either at that time or it had been just before with, Jude Law and Ewan McGregor. You can imagine, yeah. imagine the fun. Wow. That, that that. Give them uh, a sitcom. Give them a sitcom. <laughs> and, um, and I'd actually come across Ewan and Jude because they were sort of in the frame, but eventually they're not available when I was looking to cast Stuart Sutcliffe in Backbeat. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and subsequently, also when I did my next film, Wings of the Dove, they were also and, and they they'd become friends by then. So I knew I knew these guys, but I didn't know Johnny so well. And of course, then we saw a lot of act, a lot of male actors in America. Yes, I mean these were a lot of these people were 17, 18, 19. So we saw people that became movie stars. But there was just something about Johnny and Mich I trusted Michelle, and she said he's the real deal. You know, mm -hmm. there's something here, and I just loved that kind of the way that he had that. You just, he was so watchable and so skillful in terms of his sort of intern, how he could internalize the role. So I was pretty sure that I wanted him to be Dade. And, and at that point, you know, we, um, I, I told Jeff and Jeff was very, very supportive, but he said, look, if you, if you say you're passionate you think he's going to be the right guy, then, um, you know, put him, put him on a tape and and we'll send it to john and yeah. they came back and said we support you which was amazing um so then in the meantime i was looking you know we were casting all the other characters as well but yeah. then it was really important to cast um acid burn i, I did a may again and, and, and i had a casting director in the states diane crittenden and diane crittenden i'd worked with on backbeat diane, wow. had, been, diane had been my my US casting director on Backbeat. So I asked for Diane to come on and do the US casting on, on uh, Hackers, which was, which was the majority of the casting. Um, and it was great to have already have had that relationship. And, and, and then I found out that she, she'd known John Kelly, you know, from his previous incarnation working on, 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 on movies. So that, so that they were very pleased that I'd, that I'd chosen Diane. Um, and I, like I did with Backbeat, I, I, I did sessions in LA and New York. And again, we saw a lot of young act actresses who became movie stars subsequently. Um, Liv Tyler, perhaps. Tyler, yeah. Yeah, Liv Tyler was one, well, she was just one of them. But I mean, um, <laughs> I, I, I mentioned Hilary Swank. But there's some others that I'm not going to mention because... Uh, I did before and they said, oh, why did you tell people that I didn't get the role? <laughs> you know? But I mean, there are people that Falling are out. Big, big movie stars who, uh, who, who came in that car because they were 17, 18, you know? Yeah. And there was just something about Angelina, which was like, wow, she's so different to anybody else. She had long hair at the time, uh, was wearing glasses. And I didn't, I think what she was trying to do was she was trying to portray herself as a geek, you know? And she, right. She was quite, she looked at me quite strangely when I said, well, I'd want you to, you know, cut your hair off and all this kind of stuff. I didn't quite know how enthusiastic she was going to be for all that, but uh, I managed to get the, the producers to agree to fly Johnny uh, when I went on my next trip back to New York. He read with, I think, three or four other actresses uh, and they were all great, you know, it was great. But the last one he read with was Angelina and I mean, you know, if you could could actually see sparks 
you would have seen, you would have seen sparks foreshadowing um, and uh, and i think i asked each of them what you know i think i asked johnny you know which and it was i didn't need to ask it was quite clear there was just this incredible chemistry so again i showed that tape to jeff and john and you know they they weren't going to dispute the evidence of their own eyes <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was that was sort of how how, how johnny was calm it, it kind of came through my sessions with michelle gish in london um and 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 diane crittenden who i was doing casting sessions with in in, in new york and la and then a star was born <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I think everyone really appreciates about the casting and hackers is that it's such a diverse group of characters with personalities they bring to the table. And so I guess a short question, was there one character across the spectrum that you had a lot of trouble casting just right? And then piggybacking on that, what was the one that was just like, oh yeah, this is a done deal. This is easy. Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I think the plague was a difficult character to cast because it was how he fitted in, you know, with the dynamic. He was sort of of them, but not of them. You know, when Fisher came along, it was slightly different to what I'd imagined, but I saw that he would bring something really interesting. I want to say, I think, as far as I can remember, I think the other uh, kind of hacker gang, the group, the band, um, I think they... I think they kind of like cast themselves really easily and really quickly. Um, Lawrence Mason, Lord Nikon, Jesse Bradford, who was already kind of quite well known at the time. And Renly Santiago, uh, you know, they were all, and, and Matthew Lillard, of course, as, as serial killer, they all came in and they just literally had such enthusiasm and they, they nailed the audition of all, all, all of those guys. And again, it was one of the things that was very exciting to see when I saw the movie again, you know, how funny they are together, how oh, brilliantly yeah. they deliver their lines, you know, the yeah. pause, you know, like Renly and Lawrence, for example, you know, theoretically sort of like minorish characters in the group. They're just, they're, they're, they're so watchable and they're so funny. And at the same time, all of them, is that there's this kind of like rivalry between them. There's yeah. a sort of, they're trying to sort of, they're trying to kind of score points of each other, but when, they're under attack from the outside and they're in danger. They all come together as a group and support each other. And it's, I find it very emotional actually that that, and, it, and it's partly because it works because like all good actors, even if the character is supposed to be slightly larger than life or if the character is supposed to be humorous, they take themselves very seriously. Mm -hmm. they, take the, they take the performance. So they're very, they're very sincere and there's a kind of credibility and authenticity in all of those performances. Yeah, they, 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 they're that they're working in one, you know, like as one one unit, mm -hmm. supporting and helping each other with real kind of determination and real focus. It's a community we all growing up wanted to be a part of. That's right. Sure. That's right. Yeah. yeah. A real quick question: You don't still have, or by chance, have access to the original casting tapes, do you? Well, I couldn't possibly say. Uh. <laughs> oh, to man, try, to right? see some of that would be... I had to ask. Had to you ask. had to try. <laughs> so from all of us, you know, congratulations on not only the 25th anniversary, but the anniversary of the soundtrack, the two LP release and the two disc CD release, the Hacker soundtracks, one, two, three. And these ones are obviously an enduring evergreen legacy um, from that movie. Um, you touched on this a little bit before, um, but at what point did you say to yourself, like, this music, you know, is what would define kind of the soundtrack of that movie? Because it's a huge deal. I mean, it really yeah. paints like a really incredible undercurrent to what we're watching. Well, it happened pretty quickly. And again, it was with, you know, Simon and Guy and Gala and other people, you know, in the clubs we were going to. It was just, it just felt like it was the soundtrack to the movie. And the fact that it was techno, you know, it was a, it was a film about, you know, techno uh, sure, in a way. Sure. Um, uh, and again, it just, it's great music to put on, to put with images. It's it works as a kind of, those tracks, those da dance tracks, house music, whatever you want to call them. They've got a, they've got an amazing kind of beat and there's a something quite sort of anthemic about them as well. Something kind of quite ethereal um, it, it, that, that is a sort of a film music type you know, they transport you yeah. um, and the ambience as well. So it all, it just like, as soon as you put it, put the, put it with pictures, it just 
transform the scenes. I mean, the most, uh, you know, obvious uh, example is Halcyon on and on. Um, yeah, incredible. absolutely. So yeah. The way that that elevates that scene in that moment when Johnny's looking out of the plane window over a New York, you know, top shot in New York, and then that turns into a, into a computer um, keyboard, a, a computer circuit board. It's sort of like a microcosm to the film in a way. I mean, yeah. it's like that's what's happening in his head. That's what he's. That's how he sees the world, and it sort of then it it then explains everything else that you see in the movie. And so I, I think it was re really early that 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 you know that that came about. I mean, the film got together very very quickly. I mean, we shot it in sept end of September October, and then we went right through to January. I think we we probably started at the end of October in New York. So we so so it was quite early in the process that I put the I put the music on because because I you know with most as with most films you edit as you go along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. first you, you do a day's shooting two days shooting and you know three days later the 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 editor has an assembly um of the of, of those you know first few days shooting so at that point you know the music was already thinking about you know putting it on um, and, and I, i'm pretty sure i played it when we were shooting because i normally do that some some of the tracks in the clubs and things um uh and we used also we, the music supervisor was was bob last who who worked with me on backbeat, uh, and in terms of sort of what the context was, you know, the background to that music and how it was received at the time, there was a lot of interest in what the soundtrack to Hackers was going to be because uh, the soundtrack for backbeat was such a big part of the success of the film. Um, we, you know, it, backbeat takes place in 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 in, in clubs in Hamburg where the Beatles were really cutting their teeth on R&B, Little Richard, Chuck Berry. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, for that, I wanted a sound that was fresh and felt like we were there and it was happening now, not a period piece. Um, so we got Don Woz, who was a top producer, still is, but he was you know, just doing Voodoo Lounge for the Stones at the time. So his, his star was very, very high. Um, and you know, he put together, he attracted this band of what was called a grunge supergroup, which was Def Grohl, uh, Dave Grohl on drums, who was in the Nirvana at the time, Mike, Mike Mills, Thurston Moore, Greg Dully, you know, people, like, and, and you know, they won awards uh, for music, won MTV awards and things, and, the, and there were two, two soundtrack albums. So, that there, so there was real enthusiasm for what the Hackers soundtrack was gonna be. And Bob last set up a screening of Hackers for the, um, like five record companies, the main record companies. And they were like, you know, in not so many words, they're like, what is this? This, you know, we thought it's going to be like indie grunge guitar music. And what's this techno <laughs> stuff? Nobody in the States is going to listen to techno. Um, and I said, well, it's, you know, it's just the music for the movie. Um, and we only got, I was really disappointed that the CD, there was no soundtrack that came out with the release in the States in September, because in those days, the soundtrack was another form of publicity. You know, it was, it was something great that, you know, would, would, would create another life for the movie. Um, and it was only done really when the film was then released, I think the following spring or summer in, in, the, in the UK. Um, and it was done quite quickly, so we couldn't get the rights to do all the tracks. Um, which is why it's so exciting that the new double yeah. vinyl has, has got the tracks like, you know, like the Guy Pratt, Dave Gilmore track and um, Massive Attack, um, Left Field, that we couldn't put on the uh, original. Um, but at the time it was like, what is this? Why are you doing it? <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't what we want. Which is strange because, you know, I was in high school at the time, you know, it's, it's sort of the perfect demographic that you guys were shooting for in that film. And I had a friend that had just, you know, moved to the States from Switzerland and he, he brought all these trance and techno tapes yeah. and CDs. And so like that, that world for me was just blowing up. And then this movie comes out, it's like, what? Like, <laughs> I thought I was the first one in the States to know about this music. And here it is on this movie. You're instantly the coolest person in your high school. <laughs> yeah. in your, I felt that way. Here, I was right? some camouflage at the time. So, you know, it all came about. <laughs> So do you remember a few of the, were there any songs that were on your short list to put in the movie that didn't make the cut for whatever reason, or you couldn't well, get rights well, there was, to? 
Well, yeah, there, there was a whole thing with um, uh, Cure songs. Um, and and there was, uh, we were thinking of having Friday I'm in Love at the end. Um, mm. Oh, for, for yeah. The, for the song that's now the Squeeze song. Yeah. And then there was another Cure song where there was a great kind of very trippy. Purple trippy's. Haze. Purple Haze. Yeah. There was a, there was a, they, they did a version of Purple Haze, which was very, very trippy. And I think that, you know, we couldn't get a deal for those tracks. So Guy said, look, I think kind of, I think I can do something, you know, um, that's, you know, not obviously not the same. I'm not, you know, but it's just like something else that I think will do the same job is very kind of bass, you know, bass driven and quite sort of, you know, cyberdelic. Um, so, so that, so those were the, were the two. Um, but other than that, no, there was, I mean, you know, we, because they were, I can't think there's any other, any other kind of band other than Underworld, Left Field Prodigy, Massive Attack. I mean, we had them all, you know, we, there's even, mm -hmm. even a little bit of Radiohead in that. So we talked a little bit earlier about filming on top of the Empire State Building and how wild that was. Um, mm -hmm. You also filmed in Grand Central and like a, a lot of other very iconic New York locations. Um, were there any specific challenges involved in filming in those areas? Yeah, I mean, it's Grand Central and leading leading up to uh, Grand Central for the you know for the chase just oh, yeah, before yeah. the final hack. Um, I mean, that's just you know crazy logistical difficulty. Uh, but sometimes you know, sometimes filming at like three in the morning in a tiny apartment is is as challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you got to get out, and, and I think that I think that that it was quite challenging being in in Renly's flat, Renly said, you know, in in, in the phone freaks flat when he's arrested. That was you know challenging. I mean, it's it's often a it's often kind of like, and, and and getting up the Empire State Building was 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 quite was quite tricky. Um, I think we had to carry a lot of stuff, all of us, like you know, bags of camera, uh, camera camera cases, and 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 uh, and sound recording. Uh, cases I think you know I think even the cast were probably lugging them up near the step because there's no there's no elevator in la the last bit that last hundred and hundred feet or whatever so I think oh that, my yeah. god <laughs> wow <laughs> and I think also in in um in uh, you know freak's apartment I think there was no elevator there either so it was those <laughs> it, it was it was that it was that sort of thing but the, the thing when you do something like like the the, the third avenue um, we shut down the whole of Third Avenue one Sunday. That everybody sort of like prepares so much in advance for that. You know, it's all storyboarded and everything. And you got the stunt guys and the stunt yeah. drivers. Um, and there are a lot. And you have like you put in way more um, uh, kind of runners and ads. And and so it's sort of if it's planned properly, it, it actually goes really smoothly. And and it's exciting because you can see this thing happening. It's almost like a performance. You know. Um, but, but you know that those whole rollerblading sequences where they're going over the roofs of cars and things that was quite you know that was a big day I remember that was a you know we were I think I slept pretty well that night. So you um, did a lot of filming in New York but there was also quite a few scenes filmed in London. We have gotten some kind of inconsistent or disagreeing responses as to where <laughs> it was actually filmed can you set the record straight for us where was where was it filmed yeah, in london well, was it pinewood Studios, shepperton <clears throat> oh god um i think it was pinewood i'm pretty sure it was pinewood um in fact it, it, it yeah it was pinewood because we um uh, we had, you know, there was a long walk from from the from the dressing rooms because to the studios. Uh -huh. um, but we didn't, you know. So 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 we built, you know, the this the the close up set of Grand Central, which was still a huge set. We built that in Pinewood uh, with the rotating phone booths. Yeah, that, that was quite a challenging. Amazing. Uh -huh. That was quite a challenging sequence as well. Um, as was Cyberdelia. I think those were they were big sets with a with a lot of Cyberdeli was a, was a swimming bars in uh, a disused swimming bars in an area called um, to the west of London, Isleworth. It's not too far from Heath Heathrow Airport. Um, some of these interiors of the schools were in London, um, yeah. the classrooms. Um, I think the Plague's house was Johnny's apartment, um, Nikon's apartment. So there was a lot. A lot was done in 
in in London. Well, Ian, are you ready for uh, some quick fire questions if you're ready for them? Uh, and then we'll start getting into uh, our, our sort of starting to wind down the interview type questions. But uh, so this one, this is maybe just a test of how much you remember about the, the script and the film. Assuming yeah. the subdirectory of the Gibson was working really hard. There was only one user online and there was a workload for like 10 users. What do you think you might have? <laughs> a hacker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next up, if you had a hacker handle, what would it be? Well, I've already told you that my actual um, name was Ian at Crash. Yeah, so good. Never change it. Fairly sort of obvious. <laughs> but actually, the, the web, the, the server was called Demon. I think, uh, yeah. I, I don't know whether that's, uh, <laughs> whether, um, whether that's too, uh, too, too indulgent, but uh, uh, I don't know. What, what would you say? Your handle should be? Yeah, what would you, I want you to, I want you to appoint a handle for me. Should I we pose that question to the community? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, put it in the comments. Any, everybody yeah. watching this after the fact, put your suggestion <laughs> in the comments. And we'll... Let us know we should call Ian softly <laughs> from now on. So if you could pick one place to hang out um, under your hacker handle, would you hang out at Cyberdelia or would you hang out at Razor and Blades Club? Oh, Cyberdelia. Cyberdelia. <laughs> So which, which fits your personality, rollerblading or skateboarding? Uh, well, I have to say, I think skateboarding suits my personality, but um, I, I actually got okay at rollerblading just simply because I would, I would join the, at the cast. <laughs> um, Amazing. So, okay. I, so I had a, I had a set and I could, you know, I carried on for a bit afterwards, you know. Um, I wasn't as good as them, but I could, you know, I could get around on on on, on rollerblade. <laughs> but um, I sort of think skateboarding is probably more my personality. Nice. All right, Apple or PC? Apple, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like a lot of great directors in history, do you make a cameo in your own movie? No. A lot <laughs> of people on the film tried to get me to do the cameo, uh, one of the cameos at the end um you know when when we go around the world oh it's one of the yeah so there were a lot of people in fact they thought that they they were so convinced that um they were going to succeed in convincing me that i think they had my costume all worked out and everything i can't remember what it was (laughs) oh man I would we love to see the this. costume oh, yeah, we... that Roger Burton made for you. Yeah. <laughs> I've, not, I've not done that yet. <laughs> nice. Well, so we'll just... definitely get into winding down uh, the interview with, with some of these questions, but there's a few things we still have to ask a bit before we get there. So, <laughs> so going back into some of the minutia of the film for a second, um, Throughout the movie, there's a lot of paper signs like on neon paper that say things like, give me liberty or give me root access, trust your techno lust, yeah. stuff like that. Do you remember whose idea that was or where those came from? I think that was the, um, I think that was the art department. That would have been Joanne probably. <clears throat> um, and there would have been somebody, that's a really good question. There would have been somebody in the art department, some assistant. But I, I love those. Um, I love those. 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 Songs. They're major. Me too. They're so good. <laughs> They're so good. Trust your techno less is just Isn't like great? <laughs> such <laughs> an incredible, evocative. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, I was looking through some talking of those signs and things. I was looking through um, the photographs that we took in 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 the Razor and Blaze Club because that because the. Cause the the extras in that club are just unbelievable costumes, you know. The, oh yeah, the chandelier. Chandelier. Hat. Chandelier hat, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like so right off the bat, things. you give us a chandelier headpiece as soon as we get there. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> there was somebody in a, in a leather jacket wearing bondage trousers with um, Doc Martens, you know, like up to their car, the top of their calves. And on the back of the jacket, kind of like picked out in 
like safety it was safety pin these 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 kind of physical letters and it was so obscene i had <laughs> it wasn't appear in the movie <laughs> but, but the still we caught it and i was like my jaw drop was like what <laughs> we had that on set. <laughs> um okay so cyberdelia you touched on this before the club that you would hang out in um we all know that that would be such a kick-ass incredible place for us all to be um what was the so when we look at that set as a whole what was your favorite sort of aspect of that set and then where did those ideas specifically come from because it's this incredible collage of rollerblading ramps and giant you know wipe out video game screens and like all this different <laughs> stuff so I just wanted to throw it all in, you know. I mean, the ramp was obvious. Um, I, I think I said to John did that we, you know, it'd be great to have a ramp going down. That's partly why it was great having a swimming pool, so we could use those, use those different levels. And uh, um, it, it was it, again. I mean, what what happens is that, and it's one of the things that John's great at. He he gets a great team together who, who make creative suggestions all the time, and and and, and people were just you know, throwing ideas in and, you know, we knew we needed screens, we need, and, you know, how do you arrange them? And it, it almost is built up in pieces is, is, is how that thing. And, you know, I'd be shown drawings when people would ask me ideas about, and I'd say, well, maybe not that, how about putting that in there? Uh, and there would have been a model as well. I think we had a model built um, so I can kind of, you know, work out how to shoot it and things. Um, but it, it, a lot of it happens organically. Once, once, you, once you kind of like set the direction, and you've got the location and, you, and, and, and some of the big strokes, you know, like that mm. ramp I put yeah. in there. Um, then everything is, you know, there's a big contribution from the art department and all the people in it. And as you said that that was a pool that was in London um, where that interior was filmed. I, I don't believe that that pool exists anymore or- I've been what, told that. I've been what, told that, yeah. But it, where was like, that Where was that located? It's, it's it, like, what was it before? It was just a historical landmark or something, right? I think it was just a local swimming baths. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, local swimming baths. And unfortunately, you know, when I was a kid in London, there were just so many. Hmm. Every school, you know, you would, there would be part of your, you didn't have one on, in, on the school premises always. If you didn't have one on the school premises, then, then the local baths, was, it was a big, big thing, you know. Nice. Um, uh, you know, near where I was, there was a choice of four or five, you know, within half an hour's journey. Uh, big nice. public baths, you know. Huh. That, that was a quite small. That was a smallish one, but um, yeah. I mean, considering the build out that's inside that space, would that set have been the most expensive one that you guys did, or would it be that sort of Grand Central spinning phone booth one? Grand Central. Um, we actually had to build the walls of Grand Central on the floor, mm. and so that's you know that that definitely would have been the biggest um, the biggest one. Mm -hmm. So according to John Beard, as soon as you guys landed in New York, the two of you went out clubbing um, to do some research for the film. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you describe what that was like, where you went, and how that I'm experience sure that might have influenced sure the movie? Was, I'm not sure that John was always there. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, had a, we had a location um, uh, manager or scout. And you know, I asked to see some of these clubs. Um, kind of early on and then every time I went to New York he would just have a whole lot more lined up for me and, and we did it, it did it did have an input it did have an input on on the you know the design of the clubs and the and um, also just the vibe and the characters and what they would be doing um, but there were some I definitely went to on my own I went to one I think it's called the cooler which was a meat um, kind of like a refrigeration Mm. Um, uh, plant oh, wow. in in the meatpacking district, and I went there on my own, and, and that was a that was a um, a rap club, and that was quite interesting. Um, I was I was the only white guy in there, I think. Um, <laughs> and then there was another famed club called Save the Robots, which had a suitably yeah. kind of nice. So one question that we often get asked if if we know the answer to. Um, Phantom Freak, arguably the character that brings all the hackers together. Now we know the the scene was filmed because Renly Santiago dropped that uh, in his interview and in our 25th anniversary screening, but we never actually see him get out of jail. 
were you involved in the final cut of the movie and was that a difficult decision to make yeah i i mean again just going back to what i was saying at the beginning about the director i mean you you, you actually have responsibility for everything and and and, and one of it so and particularly in this film with 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 john and um jeff you know giving me so much freedom so that i would edit it i would edit the whole film in london uh, but then we took the cutting room out to the states to do the previews mm-hmm. um and i and i think that the order of the film got changed a little bit in the previews i don't think too much got cut to, to, to be honest i don't remember that scene being shot i might be wrong and i would defer to Renly if if, <laughs> if he's convinced but because there is a sort of um i mean we you know you jump to the bit in the narrative where you know he's been re- he's been he, he's been released, yeah, right? Um, so I, I I'm not sure that it would have even survived the script. Maybe he's remembering it from the maybe it was in an early draft of the script. Yeah, you um, mentioned like you, you see his girlfriend from Venezuela, and they were all you know back at Cyberdelia talking about you know what they were going to do now and things like that. Like unfortunately, stuff that we never got to see. Oh wow! Okay, well, you know, that's you've got me thinking. That's starting to ring a ring a bell. I mean, <laughs> uh, and I, you know, if I if I get the time to root through the some archive boxes, and maybe I've got a a, a VHS. Hey, Eric's up. eyes, my my eyes <laughs> perked up there. You got some archive boxes. I... <laughs> oh yeah, I'd love, I'd love to watch it. Is it in the script? Have you seen that film in the script, Eric? It's in the, the script. Scene? Yeah, that scene is it's in the, the script. It's in the book also. The novelization. The novelization. novelization. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay. Well, then, <laughs> maybe we shot it. I can certainly look at a schedule, and that'll tell us whether we shot it. Oh, right. Yeah. That would be amazing. I, I need to see whether I've got a hacker's rap book here. Uh, um, Got to be there somewhere. Yeah. Is this really happening in live? time right now in real time <laughs> uh, well i guess we don't need to ask this question about the footage yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, oh uh, my goodness uh, this is just a couple of little things you know that, that up there is there's a there's a cubby hole that's just got some of the things that i might need to refer to and then i've got a couple, two or three big big boxes of of archives but this is this is the the rat book Oh my God. Oh wow. man. Wow. So this has, it, every film has, has a rap book. Um, uh, it's got the budget in here. <laughs> when was the last time you looked at this? Oh, 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, this is the um, shooting schedule. That's cool. You wow. see uh, interior Gill on computer screen night, cast members, agent Gill. Oh my um, God! I mean, Dead Sea Scroll that's being shown to us. <laughs> <laughs> Seattle courtroom. Well, Cyberdelia would have been done in in the UK. Uh, oh yeah, here we go. Cyberdelia Day. I can't imagine we would have gone to Cyberdelia more than once. Well, there's quite a few days we were in Cyberdelia. Thursday, <laughs> Thursday the twenty seventh of October, nineteen ninety four. Uh, day listens freak and serial teach Joey. Uh huh. Next day, hackers hang. Day beats Kate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, the boys want to tie, and it's Kate's turn. Uh huh. That's still freak keeps score. It's the same scene, but this is yeah. like Saturday. It's still a tie. Day raises the stakes. Okay, Cyberdelia Day, Serial Goes to Harvard. Yeah, see? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Serial Goes to Harvard, that's Serial a good one. First of all, a spinoff. <laughs> that's, probably, that's probably the same scene where everybody, you find out what everybody, so that's scene 254, that, that might, yeah, that's a scene that was cut. Wow. Amazing! Wow. <laughs> now I've now I've got to um, see. Now uh, we're dr- we're dragging all those memories back. You know, bring yeah, it all out. Uh, and then I've got another book here, um, which is the storyboards. <gasps> oh what? no! Now you're just oh. teasing. 
Oh my gosh. Oh. So this is like that's the, oh wow. Wow. The top of the, oh my gosh. No way. And that's that's Dade on the keyboards at the beginning. Those look gorgeous. Yeah, they're really, really good. Um beautiful. Uh this is the final wow. hat. Oh no, this is the um the machine taking the uh taking the the, the umatic cassette. Yeah, the tapes, um, yeah. Wow. Going through the city of text, you see? Ah, oh, so cool. Oh, oh my wow. gosh. Um, and there, this is this is like the whole sequence because it was done as an animation, you see. That's yeah. uh, that's Joey. Joey, yeah. Joey kissing, kissing Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> is anyone else kind of sweating? I'm like kind of sweating <laughs> right now. Thank this you, is Joey. a real moment. Oh, this is from the dumpster diving. Go. Oh, going yes. shopping, going <laughs> shopping. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. These are beautiful storyboards. Yeah, yeah these are beautiful. great. Who yeah. do we need to talk to in order to okay, uh, produce is, the hackers this is, uh, book? This is the, uh, this is the um, oh, skating up Fifth Avenue. Wow. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> I mean, this is an incredible, this is a Bible. I mean, we're at church right now. Like this yeah. is absolutely. <laughs> so I mean, worship you... this every day. This sequence is done in great detail. You see there's like some guy. Oh my goodness. And Holy cow. Awesome the Bob. I mean, they're all hand done. I mean, they're beautiful. Yeah. There's That's the gorgeous. Bob. Skating yeah. into the, yeah, oh man. Well, while we're looking at the storyboards, I have to ask, do you remember any scenes that were storyboarded but not filmed or any other cut scenes? Uh, I, I think, the, I think the, the one that we found, you know, we found uh, one and I think that might be the only major, that might be the only major scene that wasn't, um, that wasn't mm -hmm. filmed. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, these are great storyboards. I mean, in fact, somebody was asking me about a book um, the other day. Yeah as well because you know there's all the you know there's there's some great um there's stills photography from the from the shoot and i've got the contact sheets up there as well like just like hundreds of photographs oh um, man you're holding and, out honestly and you're holding out <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're here to do we're here to help yeah. curate all this stuff yeah <laughs> what do you need what we do you can't need? let that stuff disappear <laughs> I have to say, I have considered compiling all of the oral history of the film and the research into some kind of book um, at some point in the future. So we may That's be in touch on that front. Yeah. Thir can yeah. we this work out a 30th crowdfund. anniversary coffee table book, maybe? Dude, yeah. this thing will crowdfund so yeah. fast if we oh, put yeah. this up. I mean, <laughs> the community is rabid for anything. What just happened? I think the internet's just going to shut down. Like I think everything is just going to shut down. <laughs> and the, the rumor is you have a 35 millimeter print of the film yourself as well. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. How long has it been since that's graced a projector? Uh, well, I don't think that, yeah, I don't think that one was used. I've got 35 mil prints of most of my films, actually. I think the distributor one, you know, had their own print and, the, and they took, you know, responsibility and everything. But yeah, I've got, a, I've got a, I've got a print, which is a nice thing. It's a nice thing to have if, uh, um, if the occasion arises to screen it, screen it myself. Are there mm. any other mementos that you kept from hackers that are just like in your mind notable that you have? I used to have some of the towers of text, you know, the Perspex towers. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't think I've got any of those. Uh, they used to be in my an office that I had in Soho, um, but the 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 animation cells just kind of fell off, and you know. Um, yeah. um, no, I don't think I've got. Well, I've, there's in terms of physical mementos. No, no. Oh, I tell you what, I do have. I've got the Urban Dance Squad um, drum drum kit piece. Oh, oh that's cool. cool. Oh, nice. cool. Drum cover. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. I got that here. I got that here in my house. They um, <laughs> they uh, they gave it to me at the end of the gig. You know when we were shooting. That's cool. Yeah. Very cool. So, one other thing, get kind of jumping back to to cut scenes and stuff, because uh, it's just kind of funny to to remember what or to see what people remember as, as standing out in their mind. Uh, obviously, there's bloopers that are filmed in in every movie. Yeah. Uh, are, are there any that stand out to you? Yeah, there was one actually, and it was that it was very um, <clears throat> it, it was um, 
it was when Wendell Pierce, the, br the brilliant Agent Pierce, uh, a a a Wendell Pierce, the brilliant <laughs> Wendell Pierce, uh, when, when he comes back into um, the the holding room where where Dade and and and, and Kate are, uh, he talks about encrypted on your laptop and somebody said don't say encrypted on your lip top <laughs> <laughs> and, and johnny and, and just lost it and so and so there was a serious scene so so then so when would go out and he would burst in so it's crypto and they would literally don't have the straight and they would just piss themselves laughing <laughs> <laughs> and he did it for and he was getting more and more frustrated and the more frustrated he got the more funny and it was it was that that weird guilty giggling thing you know yeah. you really don't want to you're trying to stop turn you're like really glad you're doing it but it was just impossible not to laugh i mean that that really so now that hackers is over 25 years old um, can you talk a little bit about any changes you've seen in the fan base since the movie's initial release? Yeah, it's 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 been interesting, and and um, it's partly to do with the fact that the film I think has been seen to have identified certain things, certainly in the kind of counterculture that have come about. And again, that's not I wasn't looking really into a crystal ball. I was just the people I were working with were sort of the people that were generating that that world, that those you know those visuals, those that that technology of interconnectivity. So I think that that's because of that the film's sort of been reassessed in in that sense. Um, certainly when we had the when we had the twentieth anniversary release, there were a lot of articles basically saying that the people that didn't kind of get the film didn't understand that it was really a film that was about the characters in the film and so that the audience was an audience that was as I said from sort of 15 to 25 really mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the people who were 15 or 16 when they saw the film are now 30 or 35 or a little bit older and some of those people are journalists and I know because they told me, they said it was a <laughs> film for them when they were at school because there weren't that many teen films. I mean, I know, you know, friends that had 15 year olds at the time and they saw it three or four times because there wasn't Twilight, there wasn't Hunger Games, there wasn't the sort of the teenage Harry Potter movies. It was either kids family movies or it was, it was sort of adult movies. Right. Uh, and, and I think that the, the people, of, the people who, who, for whom it was, they felt a personal connection to the film, people of that age group. I think they've grown up and a lot more people are now working in tech <clears throat> and people who worked, you know, and, and that's much more mainstream culture. So I think that what's happened is what was probably um, a niche audience at the beginning, either age-wise or, or people that were interested in technology, you know, those people have grown up and those people have become, and, and, and the people in tech have become more mainstream. So uh, at the same time, I think that journalists, um, you know, have, have reflected that some because they were people that saw the film when they were younger themselves. Um, and, and Mark Commode, whose who's notes, fantastic notes on the um, double vinyl and, and, uh, and CD, he was a champion for the film from the moment that he saw it at the London Film Festival in 1994. Um, and he's very proud of the fact that, you know, with every year that goes by, there's more and more of his colleagues that sort of uh, uh, join the join the cohorts. Um. <laughs> well, we we know from recent conversation that at least United Artists had in in the early 2000s considered a Hackers too, and I believe we've heard some whispers uh, from other sources as well recently about considerations of a hackers to what, if anything, can you tell us about that? Well, I think that I've been involved in conversations. I mean, it, 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 it's, I thought that it wasn't really something worth pursuing um, until the um, 20th anniversary and the subsequent screening at the festival electromagnet magnetic field and I was just aware that there were for the first time it seems you know that there's almost a opportunity whether it's themselves or whether it's their offspring for the for the sleeping nights of the round table to be, <laughs> to be woken up and answer the call <laughs> to, stay, to stay maybe just a little corner of Manhattan if not the world um, well, I can see that with with the but it, but at the same time, 
because everything's so complex and so fast moving, it's a big challenge. And I know that, for example, Double Negative, who are the guys that were the team that I put together to do the visual effects and, you know, Chris Nolan's guys, um, they, they said that they're approached all the time by people saying, you know, well, let's have a Hackers 2. Uh, and so I'm thinking about it. I'm talking to people. I was talking to Jake Davis about it, actually. Um, the, the guy from Anonymous, who I met at the Electromagnetic Field Festival. But I think, obviously, it's M MGM own the rights. So it's mm -hmm. a question yeah. of, it's a question of um, presenting something that is, is, a, is a good enough idea to be a sequel um, well, that has, that maintains a lot of the quality um, and tone and characteristics of the original, but is something that has something to say today. Well, if it happens and and you need some uh, some stand-ins or some some <laughs> temps, I, I can think of three individuals that might be really willing to do that. So. <laughs> so, Ian, I think we're just about ready to wrap things up. I just have one more question for you. Do you have any final message for all the hackers fans out there? Well, apart from hack the planet, <laughs> the planet, <laughs> hack the planet. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, their crime is their curiosity. I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's a pretty good one. That's a, good, that's a crime worth committing on a regular basis. <laughs> well, Ian, we want to thank you for your time. You've you've given us more than more than we have asked, uh, and and we couldn't be happier. Um, I would yeah, <laughs> I would love to get my hands on uh, on some of those storyboard pages, but you know I know sometimes things have to have to happen in, in their own time and in their own order. But uh, <laughs> maybe we'll pry on you a little bit for that. But um, once again, want to thank you from ourselves and on behalf of the fans. Uh, I can't wait to mm -hmm. to give people your insight into to some of these questions that we've had. And uh, here's to the here's to the next twenty five years of this fantastic yeah. film. Thank you, and thanks, thanks for your interest, guys, and everything, everything that that you do. Absolutely.